This is what I do. I train people how to fight with ancient arms and armor as authentically as possible. I've always been fascinated by how these weapons were used and the place they have in our history. Just how effective were they in the heart of battle? I'm going to put these medieval weapons to the test and discover how they help forge our history on the battlefield. The knight in shining armor is the most enduring and evocative image of the medieval period. His armor is a vibrant reminder of an age when warriors were encased in steel, and the man himself became the weapon. At the height of its evolution, armor reached a peak of artistic achievement, a unique sculptural medium that made the knight look splendid, intimidating, invulnerable. It was a triumph of technological achievement, and its development was inextricably linked to that of other weapons of war. Throughout history, armor and weapons have competed in an arms race. One designed to protect the warrior from attack, the other intent on his destruction. At no time in medieval history was this contest more fierce than on the bloody battlefields of the Hundred Years' War. For almost a century, English archers reigned supreme. Their arrow storms decimating the enemy, wiping out wave after wave of French cavalry. The quest was on to make the knight wholly invulnerable. And in 1424, outside the little French town of Verneuil, the English archers got a terrible shock. Here, they encountered a cavalry force whose armor was of such quality that it rendered their bows impotent. It was arrow-proof. This was a dramatic moment in the development of plate armor. But plate armor like this hadn't always been around. For almost 2,000 years, Warriors had protected themselves with armors made from small iron rings. People often call it chain mail, but in the Middle Ages, it was known simply as mail. And the word chain mail is misleading anyway. Look, this is a chain, just single links. That's what a chain is. Whereas mail is much more sophisticated than that. We get our word mail from the Latin word mylum, and what it is, is an extremely complex web of interlinked metal rings, each locked with an iron rivet. The Bayer tapestry shows mail as the universal armor for warriors on both sides. was particularly effective at protecting the knight against glancing blows. In a battlefield situation, the man you're fighting is going to be a moving target so that... He's moving away as you strike him. So you're only managing to get a glancing blow off the male. And in those circumstances, the male is perfectly adequate protection. 
In order to defeat Mail, the attacker had to deliver an extremely heavy blow. We need to place heavy blows judiciously. We don't want to expend all our energy with every single move that we make. We will tire far too quickly. So, for instance, if I strike at my cello and he moves away, then I've wasted a lot of energy there. I've missed him. I've become vulnerable. I need to make sure that my heavy blows can have effect so that if he comes at me, then now I can get it because I disabled him for a moment. This is the blow that counts and I can crack that down under his back with full force. Whether the male fails or not is not the central question. Here, putting a full body whack into him there, the shock is going to transmit through to the body and I'm going to disable his fighting capacity. Male was relatively lightweight and flexible, an ideal defense for a mobile knight. But innovations in mounted warfare meant that Mail had to withstand ever more powerful attacks. Most armies had similar types of armour, their defences effectively balancing each other out. But as weapons and tactics constantly developed, so too armour had to adapt in an arms race that was to change the face of war. In the 12th century, there was a revolution in military tactics. Cavalry were equipped with weapons capable of punching through mail. From the 12th century, the mounted knight became a force to be reckoned with. His weapon of first attack was the lance, capable of delivering tremendous impact. Against it, the male of the early medieval period stood little chance. In order for the soldier to survive, armour simply had to evolve. Armourers had lost ground in the medieval arms race, but not for long. A technological breakthrough would eventually shift the balance of power. There is a popular image of the medieval knight in shining armour. But most medieval armours we see today are actually from the twilight of the period, the late 15th century. Early medieval armour is exceptionally rare and quite different to this. And without the surviving examples, we have to search for hidden clues. Manuscripts hint at new armour developments, but they don't tell us enough on their own. Fortunately, our medieval forebears also left us an astonishingly accurate image of their world, carved in stone. One of the most important pieces of evidence that we have for the development of early armour after the Age of Mail is this chap here. He dates from about 1230 and he lies in Pershaw Abbey in Worcestershire. Now, as you can see, he is largely covered with mail. But here's the important clue. If you look here, under his cloth surcoat and over his mail, we can see at the side these straps. And they indicate that he's wearing a solid body defence. The details on this tomb effigy suggest that the knight is wearing what was called a coat of plates. Now, no coat of plates has ever been found archaeologically in England, although some have been found in Scandinavia, so we've got an idea what they may have looked like. And they looked something like this. They're covered with 
a fabric covering which anchors the plates together. And it's an assembly of six plates giving maximum protection against the new impact warfare. But just how effective would this defense have been when faced by a lance driven home at full speed? At the Royal Military College of Science in Shrivenham, researchers use the latest equipment to replicate and record the effect of weapons against armor. I'm going to test our coat of plates against a high velocity lance strike, equivalent to a knight charging on horseback. The armor is backed by a layer of mail and a padded cotton coat known as an akaton, which gives additional protection and shock absorption. The coat of plates has survived remarkably well. Only the highest velocity strikes have penetrated the steel. But all of those penetrations are non-life threatening. Underneath here is the mail that hasn't been damaged at all. Underneath there is the Akaton. So impact is being delivered, but this armor is proof against it. The armoured knight had regained the initiative in the arms race. And over the next 100 years, he would be armed with increasingly sophisticated defences. <laughs> the challenge was to cover more and more of the body in steel plates. The problem was that early processes of iron production only yielded small blocks, which in turn were hammered into small plates. The great breakthrough came in the 14th century. They mastered the technique of temperature control, which had been an inherent problem in the running of larger furnaces. Now, larger furnaces meant larger plates. This was a seismic change that led to a unique European achievement, an exoskeleton of full plate armor. The arms race was at full pace. Now, craftsmen in the armor-producing heartlands of Augsburg and Milan began supplying Western Europe with vastly improved defences. The large plates of steel could be fashioned into elaborate shapes. For the first time anywhere in the world, the human body could be encased in steel from head to toe. And the sight and sound of the medieval battlefield was forever changed. The knight was not a self-sufficient warrior. He needed tremendous logistical resources to put him in the field. Not least of all, he couldn't even put his armour on on his own. He needed his squire. And so, Richard, if you could help me arm. There's a manuscript, a 15th century manuscript, which tells us the order in which these things go on. And we start with the feet.
there were various styles of armour. This is a copy of one from about 1480, the late medieval period, and it's German, German Gothic. And you can see how it sort of echoes Gothic arches in churches with these glorious fluted lines here. If you pop that on my back. The other main style of armour was Italian, and this was much less fussy, much plainer, with smooth surfaces, nonetheless tremendously elegant. And it was really a, a fashion preference, a style preference, as to whether a knight went for the Gothic style or the Italian style. Okay. Although with practice, the squire would be able to get his master's armour on very quickly, Nonetheless, it does take time, and a knight would have to be ready for battle long before battle lines were drawn. So now I'm fully armed. I'm encased in this exoskeleton, in my own private world. There's enormous sensory deprivation. My vision is impaired. I can hear the sound of my own breath, but I can't hear everything that's going on in the battlefield. It's quite claustrophobic. My breathing is impaired, and yet I feel safe. Plate armour was soon put to the test. In 1337, England laid claim to the crown of France. It started a century of conflict that drove the arms race to a new intensity. When you think of the Hundred Years' War, you tend to think of three famous battles of Edward III at Cressy, of Henry V against incredible odds at Agincourt, or Joan of Arc at the Siege of Orléans. But today, I've come here to the little market town of Vernoy in northern France in search of another great battle, much less written about, but a battle of epic proportions, an extraordinary battle, and a battle in which the crash of armour played a crucial role. In the Hundred Years' War, English military tactics relied heavily on one weapon. The longbow. A well-trained archer could shoot up to 18 arrows per minute. And when deployed in their thousands, Longbowmen could decimate opposing forces of cavalry and infantry. At short range, the impact of the bow was particularly lethal. Capable of piercing even plate armour, as the French knights had discovered to their cost on the fields of Cressy and Agincourt. But in 1422, the great warrior Henry V died and his nine-month-old son became king. Henry V's younger brother, the war veteran John of Bedford, took charge of his possessions in France. Sensing an opportunity to recover lost lands, the French challenged him to battle at Ivry, 50 miles north of Vernoy. The English army was ready for the fight. Their armour donned, their swords sharpened, and arrows prepared in their thousands. But their enemy didn't make it to Ivry. They changed direction and headed south to Vernoy, where they rendezvoused with massive reinforcements. French commanders had long relied on the cavalry charge. 
but the deadly power of the longbow, particularly when shot within a 20 meter killing zone, made knights and horses highly vulnerable. What the French needed was an invincible cavalry force. So they hired 2,000 Italian mercenaries equipped in the very latest armor technology. The best impression we can get of the sort of armor they were wearing at Vernoy is a rare example in the Kelvin Grove Museum in Glasgow. Here, Tobias Capwell looks after the Avant armor. It is the oldest surviving, near complete, Italian armor anywhere in the world. What we're looking at here, Mike, are pieces of an Italian full plate armor dating from about 1440. One of the most important things to appreciate about a fine quality plate armor like this was that it was specially made for the individual. Mm -hmm. This was about fitting it to the individual's body uh, down to the very millimeter. Bespoke tailoring. Absolutely. It's properly made and properly fitted. It doesn't impede the movement of the warrior. He has to fight the enemy. He can't be fighting his own equipment as well. This is the only surviving image of the Italian cavalry dispatched to Vernoy. It's from about 50 years after the battle. And so the artist has represented the armor of his own day. Even so, it's a stirring image of massed ranks of mounted knights, each in their custom-built armors. Perhaps the most essential piece of a knight's armour is his helmet. And at the Wallace Collection in central London, there is a very rare example from the best workshops of Milan. It's kept in the care of curator David Edge. We have here a very fine Italian bassinet made in about 1390, 1400, but I think perfectly usable, carrying on being used on the field of battle into the 1430s and 1440s. Camel of mail to protect the neck and shoulders. Which is exactly the sort that might have been used at Vernoy. Oh, yes. Because it's perfect for going into arrow storms. With this steep snout, arrows would glance off here. But it does give me limitations in vision. Again, it's added protection, but because the sights are brought forward, so there's no risk of an arrow, even if it jammed there, it wouldn't quite reach the eyeball, it does limit my vision. So, if I was to put my hand here... I, I would perceive movement yeah. that far out. Great advantage of this, of course, is I can bring this up, I can breathe, I can get some oxygen in, quickly drop it down again, or I can make a quick scout of the battlefield to see where any dangers may be before I ride into them. Whatever the particular design of a helm, the key issue is the trade-off between protection and vision. When walking into an arrow storm or against the couched lances of mounted knights, I would certainly keep my visor down, giving me maximum protection, even though I've got slightly limited vision. But once I've closed to the tight press of hand-to-hand -hand combat, then... clearly is going to put me at a disadvantage. I would rather trade off the protection the visor gives me with being able to have peripheral vision, being able to keep the maximum number of enemy in my eyeline. Now obviously I can never actually see behind me, which is why I believe knights would fight in pairs, so my right-hand man would be guarding my back as we closed with the enemy. The other advantage is I can drop the bever plate as well and allow myself to breathe more. Once I'm in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, it's huge exertion, and I need a lot of oxygen. So again, I'm going to trade off that protection to be able to breathe, to be able to see, and take my chances. At the Battle of Vernoy, there would come a moment when English fortunes depended on their ability to slug it out in armour. In 
the summer of 1424, a force of 8,000 English soldiers marched towards the town of Vernoy in preparation for battle. They were confident of victory, their archers highly trained and capable of taking on any army, or so they thought. But the English military commander, John of Bedford, knew nothing of an elite force of cavalry also making its way towards the battlefield. Bedford scouts had reported that the French army had assembled on the plain outside Vinoy, but nothing the scouts had told them could prepare the English for the sight that they were to behold as they emerged from these woods. The French outnumbered their enemy two to one. And in their vanguard was a massive force of Italian cavalry. Dr. Michael Jones is an historian and expert on the Battle of Vinoy. So, Mike, here we are, pretty much where the English would have come out of these woods on the English lines. What would they have seen out there? A quite terrifying sight. Some 2,000 massed cavalry drawn up in front of the main French position. And suddenly, the English soldiers would have realized what was going to happen next. This force was going to come straight at them. This was the ideal terrain for a cavalry charge. A wide, open plateau, baked hard in the summer heat. The French forces are readying themselves for the charge. A line of archers would have been pulled across the main English position. These men would have hurriedly started to hammer their stakes into the ground, but it was August. The ground was hard. Their stakes would have made little impact. It was a flimsy defense line at best. And as they were hammering away, the cavalry moving forward with all that weight of armor would have started to shake the very earth as they gathered momentum. The Italian cavalry prepared to ride into battle in tight formation. En masse and at full gallop, they had the potential to smash through the English lines. But to what extent did a knight's armor compromise his ability to ride and fight? Weight is certainly an issue with armour, but it's by no means as debilitating as people often think. Armourers went to great pains to design armours that not only worked, but which minimised the load carried. The weight of the armour on the chest, it's thicker on the chest, it's thicker on the helm where it's protecting vital organs. But the armour on the limbs, on the arms and legs is thinner, sacrificing that ultimate protection for mobility. There's a popular myth that a knight, when knocked from his horse, can't get up again. Ha! But like many of the myths about armour, it's utter nonsense. Full Milanese armour weighed under 80 pounds, just half that carried by the modern, fully equipped marine. The workshops of Milan led the world. Even on the breastplate and the helm, their armour was only two millimetres thick. But how could such a lightweight defence be produced without sacrificing strength? There was an invisible ingredient, hardness. In the early 15th century, Milanese armourers discovered a way to increase the toughness of armour. And master armourer, Emrys, is going to make a breastplate using their technique. The secret of an armour's strength is not only in its curved surfaces, which are shaped to deflect attack and give added structural rigidity, it is also in the hardness of the steel. 
Emrys is heating the metal to red hot. He is about to plunge it under water, a process known as quenching. The sudden change in temperature will create a far more complex microstructure within the steel, making it harder. So now you're going to quench it. Now I'm going to quench it. This nice. is an exciting bit. Right, this will be a very nice sizzle. Got to get this exactly right first time. Here we go. I got to be really careful not to get it in the wrong angle. This cold plunge has transformed the properties of the steel. So it's now very hard, it's but very brittle. It's very brittle. It's, this is hard as glass at this stage. If I dropped it, it would shatter right now. So what needs to happen, it needs to be tempered, which retains the hardness, but makes it softer. That's it? exactly right, yeah. The breastplate must be reheated to make it more resilient. But judging the correct temperature is problematic. Medieval armourers did not have thermometers, so they studied the changing colour of the steel in order to gauge the degree of heat. And what I've got to do now, and this is the most crucial part, I've got to get the colour absolutely right. I'm looking for a particular blue, which will tell me when it's softened up to just the right degree. And this resets the, the metal. It makes it flexible springing, in fact, and it's getting very close now. As the temperature rises, steel turns to yellow, to brown, to blue, to red. It's the craftsman's eye. It is. If you're riding into battle, you've got to hope that your armourer had a good eye for colour. Yeah, It has exactly to be right. the right one. You see? See how blue that yeah. is? You see the colour? Gorgeous, gorgeous That is absolutely colour. spot on. That's ready to rock. Once the metal turns blue, it is quenched a second time, permanently fixing its hardness. Just a dip, just to cool it off. It's an instant. What this is doing is setting the metal again. It's setting the molecules in the metal. And there we are. And that is a perfect spring hardness. Huh? So that is now ultimate hardness. That is, it's, it's as good as it gets. Arrows will bounce off that. At Vernoy, the Duke of Bedford deployed 2,000 archers to resist the impending cavalry charge. But just how effective would his arrows have been against hardened Milanese armour? At the Royal Military College of Science, we put our breastplate to the test. Here's the breastplate we've had specially made and specially hardened and toughened, just the sort of thing they might have been wearing at Vinoy. So let's see how this will stand up to the power of the longbow. Three, two, one. The breastplate has been struck at 140 miles an hour, to replicate an archer shooting within the killing zone, just 20 meters away. Goodness, look at this. There is some penetration. Look at that. You can see the hole, it's penetrated, it's gone through. But look what it's done to the arrowhead absolutely flattened it. That's absolutely blunt. But what of the padded coat underneath? I don't think there's a mark on here at all. The man hasn't even received a scratch. If you were an archer at Vinoy, and you would see your arrows sticking out of the Lombard breastplates, but the men still sitting tall in the saddle, it would have made your blood run cold.
At Vernoy, the 8,000 English were hugely outnumbered. And coming straight at them was a cavalry force of 2,000 arrow-proof knights. When the archer fire was so ineffective, arrows would have not only bounced off the armor of the cavalry, but bounced off the horse's armor as well, not breaking the momentum of the charge at all. And then crash, just, just knocking aside the, the line of archers, a bit like a wave, just blasting aside an old wooden jetty. And then the shock as the archers are trampled over, killed, dispersed, and then this force of cavalry moving on, gaining speed all the time, and does exactly the same thing to the main English position. Line upon line of English soldiers were annihilated in this medieval blitzkrieg. And at this moment, it looks like the game is up, the battle is lost. It's a catastrophic defeat for the English. And this is the rumor that now spreads in the surrounding countryside. The English army has been wiped out on the field at Verneuil. The Italian mercenaries tore through the English ranks and pillaged the baggage train. English forces were scattered, confused, and in total disarray. But the battle wasn't over yet. The French had victory in the bag, but the French had reckoned without John of Bedford. He was Henry V's younger brother, and he was regent of France governing it for the infant King Henry VI of England. This was his land, his domain, and he would have victory here or die in the doing. He summoned his commanders, he gathered his men, and he told them, look, you're dead. Your baggage, your possessions mean nothing. All that matters now is your personal honor. All that matters now is your fame and glory. Follow me, I will lead you. We will win this day. And with that, Bedford turned and led his knights into a bitter hand-to-hand -hand struggle. On the battlefield of Vernoy, the English archers had been defeated by the charge of heavily armoured, arrow-proof cavalry. But the English rallied under John of Bedford to engage in desperate hand-to-hand -hand combat with the main body of the French knights, a grinding, battering maul. An eyewitness, Jean de Warin, was in the front line. The blood of the dead spread upon the ground. The two armies fought with all their might, and no one could tell who was winning. In this fierce and bloody warfare, the men in armor were not wholly invulnerable. There were weapons designed specifically to defeat armor. And in the vaults of the Burrell Collection in Glasgow, there are some rare original pieces from the time of the Hundred Years' War. They are looked after by curator Tobias Capwell. Look at this pollux, that is absolute beauty. This is really one of the classic late medieval knightly weapons. And the late medieval part of it's quite important because these don't really appear until the development of full plate armor. And you can see that they're designed specifically to counter that sort of yeah. defense. Bah. You have the beak on one side for um, crushing or puncturing armor. You have a top spike which has a very stiff uh, rectangular cross section uh, and a, a blade for, for more general purposes. But this is another type of 15th century concussion weapon. Uh, it's a flanged mace dating from about 1450. It's fantastically elegant, isn't it? Anyway? Yes, yes. It, it's not particularly large or heavy or clunky. It's a, a small, fast, elegant weapon, as you say. But what they do is they focus 
the, the energy onto a very small area and conducting the force of a blow straight through a particular area of the opponent's body. But of course the other way of defeating armour is having hit them on the head when the knight's down to actually deliver the coup de grace. What they called at the time a ballock dagger. Yes. It's a classic medieval weapon uh, designed for defeating armour in an entirely different way. Notice, unlike uh, a normal dagger or a normal knife, it doesn't actually have any cutting edges at all. It has a very rectangular cross-section. It's essentially a spike on a stick, and it's purely for punching through armour or punching through the gaps in armour. Whether or not an armor is actually penetrated by a weapon is not the only consideration. The body can still suffer immense injuries from what is known as blunt trauma. That is the shock waves going through the armor to the body itself. It can cause hemorrhaging, it can cause fracture of bones, concussion, unconsciousness. We've set our breastplate up on this gelatin block. I am now going to hit it with the business end of a polax and we will be able to see the shock waves as they go through. So our breastplate remains structurally intact. But the man inside may have been seriously injured by violent shock waves running through his torso. The Polax was a high status weapon of choice for knights fighting on foot. And it was especially favored by Bedford. So how did John of Bedford fight with his Pollax? Well, we have a clue in a 15th century manuscript, Le Jeu de l'Ache. It's anonymously written, but it tells us in quite detail how this weapon should be used. One of the first things it tells us is a lot of the fighting is done with the cue of the weapon. That's the tail end of the weapon, which has a spike, not with the axe end. In fact, the manuscript tells us, take a number of jabs at the enemy's face and the feet to discomfort your enemy before you start. Another useful tactic that the manuscript recommends is to use your polax as a lever. So Stuart, if you take a guard, come at me any way you like. I can do that, drive it through here. Now I've got tremendous levering power and I can get him to the ground and finish him off. Other fight manuals also show the ax being held behind the back here. The main advantage of this position is it's an invitation. If I'm like that, Stuart, does that suggest anything to you? Does it invite you to attack? Yeah, you look uh, undefended and, and certainly more vulnerable to from this strong guard position to cut up to your armpit. Why don't you try that? I can step back out of the way, bring my axe down, disabling his arm, get in, hook him round the neck, bring him forward, and there's the killer blow as he falls. It really is a most robust and vigorous weapon ideal for the determined grit with which John of Bedford went into battle that day. Bedford forced the French back towards Vernoy. And now they found themselves trapped, forced up against the steep defensive ditches surrounding the town. Here they were massacred. The bodies of heavily armoured men were rolled down these slopes, their bodies piling high as the slaughter continued, the dead and the half-dead. The bodies of the living were either drowned or crushed by the sheer weight of armour and men on top of them. No quarter was given. This was murder. The Italian cavalry returned from their pillaging to find the battle over. Despite his opponent's superior numbers and their cutting-edge armour, Bedford's men had won the day. No armour is proof against an unbreakable will. And at Vernoy, 
Bedford's fighting prowess had prevailed against overwhelming odds. His enemy was vanquished, and his king, Henry VI of England, was now also crowned King of France, the first and only monarch to rule both kingdoms. Medieval weapons were a triumph of craftsmanship and ingenuity. But a weapon's potential could only be realized in the hands of a skilled and courageous warrior. Mastering the art of arms took years of dedicated training. It was at the center of a martial culture that dominated medieval Britain. A culture that carved out our history on the battlefield and paid for it with the lives of the archer, the knight and the foot soldier. 